to Joe. Um, so for those who are working in science, it's no secret that research equipment is highly expensive and we almost always rely on specific suppliers to do maintenance uh, whenever things go wrong with an equipment. And we don't know if they uh, how they work and we have to trust that they will do the job and that there is someone who can repair and fix the equipment if something goes wrong. For education, it's even worse because uh, since the equipments are so expensive, and to access research equipment, so the experience we give to students regarding lab work and research is quite limited and it's hardly replicable in the classroom. So in the Rigos network, we are actively promoting open source hardware as a way of democratizing the access to research equipment and give education more support. And we are a community of researchers, developers and artists seeking alternatives to traditional inter intellectually protected equipment that can reach the resolution we need for fieldwork, research and education. Actually, right now in Buenos Aires, there is a workshop about the building of open source sensors for environmental monitoring, uh, gathering people from Argentina and Chile. So for all these reasons, we are today with Joan Long. Joan Long has a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Glasgow, and she's the co-founder of IO Rodeo, a company dedicated uh, to the commercialization of open source equipment for research and education. It is often thought that open source and business do not work together, but companies like IO Rodeo prove us wrong. So this is a great honor for us to meet her today and to meet with Joe and listen to her about the story of her company, the reasons why you decided to get into open source technology and why to get them to the, to the market, and maybe also to know about the barriers and difficulties you had to overcome to be a successful company today. So thank you, Joe, for being with us today, and it's all yours. <laughs> Well, thank you so much um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's so cool to, to learn a little bit about, um, about what the work that everyone is doing as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay. Sorry, hold on one second. Okay, can, um, can you all see my screen? Okay, okay, so um, right, so good morning, everyone. Um, and it's, uh, it's really great to be here to talk to you all about IO Rodeo. Um, I just want to say thank you to the organizers of this talk, and especially um, Severin and Fernan for this opportunity to meet you all today. This um, presentation is about um, 30 minutes long, and I have put together um, an agenda on the next slide for you. So uh, here is the agenda for today's presentation. Um, I'll start by giving an overview of IO Rodeo, um, our team, the journey that we've been on over the years and highlight some of our open hardware products and collaborations. And then next we will shift to learning about our customers and why they choose to use open hardware instruments. And then finally, we will end with a brief discussion on how businesses like IO Rodeo of, that offer commercial open science hardware can contribute to the broader goals. Um, and I also um, mainly at Raya Rodeo, I mainly work on the documentation, application support and community development. Um, Will is our other co-founder and um, his role at iRodeo is mostly the hardware and software development. Um, Will also splits his time 50-50 between IO Rodeo and Caltech, where he works as an instrumentation engineer. So before starting IO Rodeo, we both had experienced, um, you know, when working in labs and in education, the limitations of black box scientific instruments. And um, we realized that there was a lot of potential for open source science hardware. And so with this in mind, we founded IO Rodeo um, in late 2009. And we actually initially started as a consulting company. Um, we were um, doing that for about seven years. 
and we were developing and making um, highly specialized instruments for behavioral biology. Um, and we found that our customers who were mainly researchers and academics um, were very receptive to the idea of open source hardware and software, um, which obviously, you know, we, um, it's important to them as well to be able to share um, knowledge and knowledge transfer that's important for their work too. And so, um, so that was our consulting part of our business. And we were doing that, as I mentioned, for the first seven years. But during that, around the same time, we were also figuring out how to transition to developing products. Um, and from our experience doing the consulting work, we knew that we wanted to make low cost and accessible scientific instruments that anyone could use and customize as they wanted. So we've had various product lines over the years. I'm going to cover them chronologically um, in the next few slides. So one of our first line of products was insect flight arenas for behavioral biology and neurobiology. Um, the panels controller system shown in these images has a long history in insect flight. But it, and it was not something that we originally developed at iRodeo. In fact, the generation of panels that you see here was initially designed by Michael Reiser, um, a researcher at Caltech. Um, we were approached by Michael early on when we were um, early on in iRodeo to start selling and supporting the system. And the reason for this was he was getting a lot of requests from other labs. around the world who also wanted to use instituted several unique designs um, we just um, developed like a bunch of commercial to get more accessible to a number of researchers needed to build and troubleshoot the system we were also um, able to make it affordable around the world we actually sold them we probably sold them to most labs they came close to saturating the market selling the system um, went west however this system is still actively used in labs around the world <clears throat> and because it's open source software, um, hardware, sorry, people are still contributing to its development, including iRodeo, um, and though no one else has currently commercialized it. So this is a good example of, of how an open hardware um, product can be independent of the company that's selling it and how the design belongs to the science community. <clears throat> Another line of products we have is our open colorimeter. Um, like spectro spectrometers, they measure absorbance of light through a sample, and they have lots of applications such as like water quality assays, assays for protein um, concentration, or really any colorimetric assay. They are um, used in education, um, and for example, like teaching biochemistry, like Beer's Law is a good example. We actually began it as a, kick as a Kickstarter that was funded in 2012. And we've been selling this product for about 11 years. We took a small break in 2000, uh, around 2021, where we redesigned the colorimeter. Um, it was originally Arduino based, but um, we redesigned it to use the Pi badge, which is a development board um, by Adafruit. <clears throat> and this incorporates new technologies into the design. Um, the firmware is in CircuitPython. Um, we made it standalone, which was a request from the community, um, battery powered, and we added a display. Um, and you can see an exploded view of the, cur of the cur um, current open colorometer design in the lower right corner there. <clears throat> A third line of products that we used to sell um, was equipment for DNA gel electrophoresis. Um, this was a really popular line of products. Um, we designed and manufactured gel boxes, transilluminators, power supplies, um, imaging enclosures as well. Um, and we actually sold these for about eight years. Um, they were very cool products, but we found out um, as we were making them that they required a lot of um, manual labor on our part. Um, 
you know, so that was kind of a lesson for us that we learned about when, when you're designing um, an open hardware product, you also want to think about like how you're going to manufacture it. Um, and so we, and then around 2020, um, 21, we actually ran into supply chain issues as well. And so we eventually decided to focus on some of our other product lines. But we want to point out that the design files for all of these products um, are, you know, available um, online. You know, there's the open hardware, so people are still making them. Um, we have instructions as well, and so I think this again shows an advantage of of um, open source hardware. You know, be living beyond um, a business. Okay, and then finally, our fourth product line that we have is our line of potentiostats. Um, potentiostats are instruments commonly used in physical chemistry labs, um, where they're used to study redox or electrochemical processes. Um, our interest began actually with the, a request from a high school teacher in LA who wanted to use um, the cheap stat potentiostat in a summer project that he was running to study water quality in the LA River. The um, CheapStat is um, another open source potential stat developed by the Plaxco Group at UCSB. And we contacted the Plaxco Group first um, about commercializing the CheapStat, and they were happy with us to do for us to do that. Um, so the Wilder CheapStat um, was a great design. Um, we did run into, similar to the, um, the Transilluminators, we ran into manufacturing issues and support. Um, this time mostly around like replacing obsolete parts and troubleshooting the software. But we noticed, you know, we found out that there was a, there was a demand for an affordable commercial open source potential that, that, the, that uh, market was clearly there. So we decided to design our own rodeo stat, uh, our own potential stat, sorry, which we called the rodeo stat. And we're currently actively developing around this product all the time and adding new features. So as a sort of going into a bit more detail of our open source hardware products uh, in the next couple of slides, we'll just look a bit more closely at our potential stat products. So shown here are two of our open source potential stat, the rodeo stat feather wing, and then the rodeo stat in the center. The rodeo stat potential stat is a complete instrument. It comes pre-programmed with firmware and includes various voltammetric tests such as chrono amperometry and cyclic voltammetry. It also comes with a Python library from, for controlling it from a host PC, web app software um, for controlling it without programming, and also includes a 3D printer, uh, printed enclosure, sorry, and other accessories like a dummy cell for testing. And the RegioStat Featherwing is a small but very low cost $20 potential stat. Um, it's not standalone, so you do need an accompanying microcontroller development board. So this is really meant for adding a potential stat to an embedded project. So as a reminder um, for anyone who's not an electrochemist, um, a potential stat is an electrochemical sensor. It has three electrodes, um, a working counter and reference and it uses feedback for control. It actively controls the potential between the working and a reference electrode and using the counter electrode as an actuator while simultaneously measuring the working electrode current. There are actually a lot of applications for potential stats, including um, characterizing electrochemical processes, studying um, coatings or corrosion, and biosensor development. Um, an example of a biosensor that we all um, usually know is the glucose test strips that, um, that we're all familiar with. Those are our biosensors. Um, so we've been selling the RodeoStat for six years now, and we've shipped them to over 300 different cities around the world. So in addition to hardware design, we also provide open source software. So our, our open source software ensures that our devices are as programmable and customizable as possible from um, like the firmware, which for the RodeoStat is programmed via the popular Arduino IDE to a Python library, which uses the standard Python scientific stack, SciPy, NumPy, and Matplotlib. In addition, we try to provide um, lots of coding examples to get people started. 
So in addition to the hardware and software, we also know um, that documentation is vital for open hardware projects. And this is also true for commercial products. We, um, we host most of our documentation on our site, um, blog.iorodeo.com. And product guides are our main doc source of you know main documentation. So shown here is the um, product guide for the open colorimeter. And these guides usually include links to design files, bill of materials, um, uh, lots of software guides and tutorials, and assembly instructions, which we're you know constantly working on adding to. Um, and last year, I also wanted to point out that last year, we also started certifying our designs via the Oshawa certification process um, so that our customers can be assured that our products are uh, verified as open hardware products. Um, as I mentioned, we do like to write tutorials when we can about um, how to use our products. Um, so here's some electrochemistry tutorials, for example. And the goal is that um, people can learn by example, like they can um, look through our tutorials and we also try to provide fun projects to get people started, um, just learning how to use our instruments. And we find that these are really popular and people are, are um, you know, contacting us about them and asking, you know, for tips and stuff. So they definitely get used. And um, finally, we usually have a few collaborations on the go at any one time. And so these are two collaborations that we're currently working on. Um, there's a lot of text here, I know, but the first is a project to develop a low-cost arsenic test kit. And this is actually a project that came out of a paper that was published last year, um, where scientists from several different labs developed an electrochemical method using the rhodiostat um, to test for arsenic contamination. Um, most of the testing was conducted at Caminos de Agua's nonprofit in central Mexico. And the goal of this project is to put together a complete DIY open hardware project with, a, a tutor, you know, with tutorials and a list of materials that anyone around the world that wants to measure arsenic contamination in their own community can follow. Um, there's also a currently go ongoing uh, a summer project right now, which I've highlighted, and this is an undergraduate training program that Jorge Aloyo at Rice University is currently running, um, where they'll be highlighting some of this work. This is, a, um, this is a really cool collaboration that we're really excited to be part of. The second collaboration I'm highlighting is with researchers at the Institute of Environmental Science and Research in New Zealand. Um, a researcher there had actually seen our open colorimeter and contacted us um, to ask about like modifying it to become a tool to measure fluorescence, which was already something we were kind of thinking about. And so we're currently testing this prototype and we'll be sharing updates via our, um, we, our newsletter. And so of course, you know, this will be open source hardware as well. So in this next section, uh, we're going to talk about how and why our community is using open source hardware instruments. So as instrument makers, um, we all spend a lot of time designing hardware, writing software and documentation. But in the end, we really want to make, you know, we really want people to be using and modifying and sharing designs. And so these images show some of our products being used in labs and classrooms. And this is kind of the end goal, right? And so as all of us are advocates for our open source hardware, we want to try and understand like how and why people choose to use open hardware. What are they using it for? And what are the benefits to their work? And we want to know this um, because it makes us better able to design right tool, the right tools and resources and identify any barriers that come up. So over the last 13 years, um, since we started iRodeo, we have developed a global community. Um, so it's not just confined to the US where we're located, but we typically see around 50% of our community um, is international. In this representative um, data from the last 11 months, um, you can see 38 countries represented. So our global community is made up of customers and non-customers. Um, and customers, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? These are people who are purchasing open hardware products from us. 
And we'll be looking at this segment in more detail on the next few slides. But it is also worth mentioning that non-customers over here are a very much a valued part of our community. And these are people who interact with us in some significant capacity. They can be collab all the way from like collaborators to newsletter subscribers. Um, many of them fill out the content, you know, they fill out our contact forms. Um, they have questions about making instruments or, or they're looking for advice um, or application, advice on their applications. Um, and they are also great for like new product um, ideas as well. And um, so they're a very interesting and important segment for, for us. However, for the purpose of this talk, because we're talking about commercialization and running an open source hardware business, we will maybe mainly focus on the customer segment. So to learn more, we ran a survey at the end of last year and we asked um, customers, for, like, so the first question we asked sorry, was about what what's their affiliation? And um, so what type of institution are you affiliated with? Um, not surprisingly, we found that the largest group was university with 47% of the responses. Um, and the next group is businesses at 28%. And then this is followed by national labs, government labs, um, private research institutions um, at 8%. But we also, uh, and we also sell to schools, nonprofits, makerspaces, and individuals. Next question we asked was, how important is it that the tools that you use are open versus closed? And over 80%, which is like these two categories together, rated importance of open hardware as extremely or very highly important. But this is probably not surprising as these are people that are volunteering to take an open source hardware survey. We next asked um, whether they are purchasing uh, and or making open hardware designs. And we found that over 50% reported that they're purchasing open hardware with an additional 30% reporting using a mixture of both purchasing and making their own scientific instruments. Next, we asked what features they look for when purchasing open hardware. Not surprisingly, documentation and affordability polled the highest with about 80, um, sorry, 70% um, of respondents. And this was followed by community support as, most, as the next most important when purchasing open hardware. But clearly affordability and documentation were the two standout features that customers look for when purchasing science, science instruments. And the last question we um, asked was how they use open hardware in their projects. And you can see the responses on this slide. Um, we also included some quotes from sample responses. Um, when we break down the responses, we see that roughly 25% are using it for educational purposes and 75% are using it for research and development. And the research and development can be further broken down into biosensor research and development, biochemistry, molecular biology, environmental um, science, hardware development, biotechnology, biomedical research, and electrochemistry research. And, and obviously these are responses are um, a reflection of the instruments that we sell. So to get further insight into, um, we, we selected a representative from the 25% education segment and someone from the 75% research segment. And we asked them to share with us how they're using open source hardware. So this um, slide shows graduate student Joshua Kudoto from the Leddy Research Group at the University of Iowa. Uh, Joshua and his colleague Andy are using the Rodeostat in undergraduate electrochemistry classes. Um, they were recently, um, recently awarded a grant um, to expand the project to um, even more labs. Um, this image shows Josh setting up an electrochemical cell using the Rodeostat. Um, so we asked Josh to share with us how and why they're using open hardware for educational purposes. And this is what Josh shared with us. We chose the Rodeostat for our classroom because it offers flexibility and robustness. Being open source hardware, instructors can better tailor experiments to match the learning outcomes of an experiment or course. In operating the instruments, students can execute provided scripts or build the operating code from the ground up. This makes the instruments suitable for both introductory and advanced courses, ranging from the basics of voltammetry to creating custom waveforms. 
From an educational perspective, a major benefit of RodeoStats over proprietary hardware is exposure to coding languages. Writing and interpreting code is a valuable skill for modern chemists and is often overlooked in curricula. By using open source hardware in the classroom, we are giving students experience that will aid them as future scientists. In the next example, we'll hear from someone in research and development. So Francesca Carlo, um, Carla is the principal scientist at the Diamond Light Synchrotron in the UK, where they build custom electrochemistry instrument, instrumentation. The Diamond Light Source is the UK's national synchrotron science facility. The IO7 is a high resolution X-ray diffraction beamline for investigating the structure of surfaces and interfaces under different conditions. The beam lines um, support complex experiments and because of this, it's necessary for the scientists there to be able to easily control the hardware. Um, shown on this slide is an example of the kinds of experiments Francesca and his team are doing at the IO7. But the, for the purposes of this talk, um, we don't need to understand all the details of this experiment. But what, but what is important to understand on this slide is that they, um, they need to be able to change the um, Sorry, they need to be able to change the solution in electrochemical style at the same time as controlling the um, a pi potential. So here you can see in box two um, on with the x axis is time, and you can see as time goes on, they are cycling through different solutions while at the same time um, changing the potential of the cell. So on the next slide, you can see how this looks in the lab. Um, so you can see the rodeo start here on, on the left hand side and the electrochemical cell in the center which has the tubing coming out and that has the working counter and reference electrodes. And um, the tubing is connected to the solution distribution system. So we asked Francesco to share with us the importance of using open hardware for his work. We decided to use a radio start for this application because commercial systems don't have enough flexibility. We wanted to be able to directly control the instrument using scripts, which is something commercial instruments and software do not allow to do. For us, it was also important to control from the same Linux machine multiple hardware components and have the possibility of creating scripts to coordinate the actions of the different components. Um, okay. And finally, another way we can learn about how our customers are using open source hardware is to look in the literature. So last year, we conducted a search for um, published papers using the term Rodeostat, and then we looked for any mention of why they chose to use open source hardware. Okay, so this first slide shows some selected quotes from papers where they mention accessibility as being important. So they said open hardware dramatically increases accessibility, lowers the cost, and provides access to tools in low resource and resource limited labs. In the Kandahari paper, um, they actually talked about how in labs, you only have one potential stat that everyone shares because um, they're a very expensive piece of equipment. Um, and so students are typically watching a demonstration, but when using open source hardware, you know, uh, for example, our Rodeo stat costs $250 versus a traditional instrument is in the thousands. So now you can have an instrument for every pair of students so they can do the experiments themselves instead of watching a demonstration. Beyond accessibility, we can also see from the literature that other benefits include access to open source software with sample code, online support, um, simplified integration with other hardware, and the ability to make custom modifications. So in summary, we learned a few things about why our customers um, are using instruments through doing surveys, by talking directly to customers and reviewing the literature. And they report that open hardware is more easily incorporated into a larger custom instrument, it's programmable, flexible, um, custom modifications um, create new instruments. Um, it also provides a way to naturally include programming into science education in a similar way, similar way to what happens in practice, and it can dramatically increase accessibility to instrumentation because it's low cost, affordable, and you know access to hands-on learning. Okay, and then we're in the final section. So hopefully in that last section, you learned a little bit more about our customers and the kinds of things they're looking for when using open hardware. 
Um, in this section, we want to switch to talking about the specific services that businesses like IO Rodeo provide and how these services can address the barriers to accessing open science instruments. Since we started IO Rodeo, the number of open science hardware companies has grown consider considerably. Um, conveniently, um, one of your colleagues, Tobias Wenzel, published a paper recently, which included a table of open hardware companies relevant for biology labs. Um, this table includes science-focused labs like Backyard Brains and um, Beneficial Bio and Sandworks, as well as larger companies like Adafruit and SparkFun that are not um, science-focused um, businesses, but include lots of open hardware development boards and sensors and more. Um, in fact, um, this would be a good time to point out that we would not be able to do our work if it wasn't for companies like Adafruit, um, who produce open uh, hardware components that we use in our instruments. So to understand why companies like IO Rodeo and the others listed here are needed in the open source hardware space, we need to understand um, first what the pain points or barriers that users face. So on this slide, um, we've listed seven potential pain points or barriers that users can face when building a non-commercial open science instrument. We put time at the top of the list as this might be one of the biggest and most obvious barriers to making an instrument from scratch. Um, it's not hard to understand why a researcher or an instructor with limited time available might decide to just go ahead and purchase a closed proprietary instrument rather than building their preferred open hardware science instrument just because there are no other options available. If multiple instruments are needed for teaching lab, for example, this can also make it particularly burdensome, like if they have to make 10 of the same instrument, for example. From our experience, um, it can also be um, more expensive trying to source individual components from a bill of materials than if you can just purchase an, um, a kit or assembled instrument. Um, additionally, you may run into issues, for example, if you're soldering, um, you make a soldering mistake like we've all done or ordered the wrong part and you end up having to spend extra than you budgeted for to buy replacements. Um, troubleshooting. I think we can all relate to how frustrating it can be to troubleshoot a, a piece of equipment that isn't working and having no one to turn to for help can be a huge barrier. Obsolete designs. Um, once a design is shared, it might not take long before the listed parts become obsolete or very difficult to source. Documentation. Um, this would actually bring us to like incomplete documentation as well, the obsolete parts. Um, and this can be a, another significant barrier. Um, ge geographical inequities, something we often hear about too. This can occur when a design um, uses a part that is difficult for anyone to source locally or whenever there are language barriers around the documentation. So open hardware businesses that are commercializing science hardware can alleviate these barriers through um, the services that they offer. So these services include manufacturing and assembly. This obviously addresses the time pain point discussed on the previous slide. Affordability, um, companies are buying in bulk so they can be cheaper than, um, than like an individual researcher who only needs components for one instrument. This was definitely true when we were making the panels display controller, for example. Um, <clears throat> testing, we test all our orders before shipping. So this can address most immediate needs for troubleshooting. And customer support um, also goes along with um, addressing the troubleshooting barrier. This is a vital service that the company should be, provide, should be providing. Um, for example, we have a pretty robust customer support system in place and we're usually able to respond quickly to customers. Shipping, um, this goes addresses the inequities around location um, and can increase accessibility, especially when there are no um, alternative options. Um, oh, excuse me. Up to date documentation. Similar to customer support, um, this is a really important service. I would um, also say that this is a very time consuming aspect of the business, and, and we do try to keep on top of this as much as possible. Um, redesigns. 
So you may not often think about this, but as parts become unavailable and new technologies arrive, companies need to stay on top of changes and make appropriate um, changes to software and hardware. And this is usually at costs that are not passed on to the customer. So for example, we recently had to redesign um, the Rodeo Star because the TNC board that we were using is, um, became unavailable. And um, so we had to redesign an, around another development board. Um, return policy. This doesn't happen that often, but sometimes people will buy and you know they'll they'll it won't work out for them for whatever reason. It's not going to be um, uh, what they're looking for for their project, and so they can send it back to us, and we offer a refund for refund, obviously. And sometimes people just want to they're not sure, so they you know they can just um, try the instrument, and if it's not right for them, they can send it back. Um, and this obviously would be a lot easier than building an instrument from scratch before finding out that it doesn't actually work, do what you thought it was going to do. Um, so while open hardware businesses may not be able to address all of the barriers um, described in the previous slide, we should expect that, um, that they to see at least most of the services um, listed here. So in summary, um, we believe that open source science companies play a valuable part in the broader open source hardware science community. They um, increase accessibility to tools and also engage new audiences. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about open hardware science businesses and um, open hardware products, we would love to invite you to join the Open Science Shop community. Um, this is a GOSH supported cooperative. Um, it's a shared marketing co-op where members are sharing skill sets, experiences and resources and uplifting each other's work. Um, the project was recently rebooted and we joined um, fairly recently with along with other founders and makers from other science companies. Um, so if you'd like to join, um, please reach out and I can make sure that you can get connected. And finally, um, feel free to please check out um, IO Rodeo at our website, iorodeo.com. Um, we have a newsletter, so you can um, subscribe to our newsletter. That's where we mostly post up, um, new um, features and things. Um, and you can follow us on social media. Um, we have, I've also included our emails here. Um, we would love to hear from you. And I didn't have time to mention marketing, um, but please do, if you're interested in marketing, um, there's a recent feature on our marketing strategy at supereasydigital.com. And thank you again for coming to this talk and I look forward to your questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk, it was pretty nice. Uh, anyone, some question? Nate. Hi, thank you for the Hi. really, really cool talk. Um, oh, I love you. hearing about this stuff and it's cool to see this community growing more and more. I wonder, um, and you mentioned some of this stuff in terms of redesigns, and this seems like it relates a lot to repair or to, for example, the chip shortage that we're kind of hopefully coming out of now. I assume that's why you changed the board. Is that in the user's hands at all? Like, is there any interchangeability for you to fix or repair or change any of those things? Or is it really built in? I'm not really familiar with how these devices are made, I guess. Hmm. Or is that is that a goal, I guess? Um, that's a great question. We do try to make um, any addition and additional um, work, like for adding a feature um, to the hardware, we try to make it so that current users can just uh, like get or order or make a part to, to um, like, for example, when we made the multiplexer, um, we made it so that people who are currently using the rodeo stat all they had to do was buy or make um, a make or break um, board and they attached together. And so it wasn't like they had to buy a whole new instrument um, in order to use that feature. So we do really try to make things, um, make it so that people aren't having to buy a whole other instrument if, if, the change to, if there's a change to hardware. Sometimes like with the redesign around the Tootsie, um, it's not really possible. Um, we did have to make quite a few changes to the board um, and so, <clears throat> so they would have to, so it uses a, t, um, a completely different board that, um, so we had to redesign it. Um, so there was, there was no way for, we did get asked this question from someone who already had the board and wanted to use the new design. Um, and it's like, 
unfortunately not possible, but where well, maybe, yeah. mm -hmm. but maybe open, good... only open to the most courageous of <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> and I should point out that Will is also on this call, and um, I think if you have anything to add, Will, uh, who's um, our designer, um, please feel free to jump in. But it's a great question. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Well, Yeah, so I think with the with the um, the teensy to itsy change in that particular case, the the pinout was so different that you know the two hardware boards couldn't you, you know you have to get a new hardware board. It, it, otherwise, you you have to do a whole crazy pile of wiring to to, to adapt it. Um, we were able to share like the firmware is the same, and so it's just just a, a you know a, a sort of flag in the firmware you can change you can compile it for the different boards, but. But the okay, hardware's... so that is what I was asking. With a crazy pile of wiring, you can make a new dev board work, right? Um, I mean, you, yeah, I mean, you could adapt the old dev board. Yes, if if you were really Just courageous, ask. you could do it. <laughs> but yeah, it's not cool. a drop in. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. So, Luto. See. Um, yeah. Th thanks for for the talk. Uh, maybe you mentioned this, uh, and I. Maybe miss it when I when I had to uh, go away for a minute. But um, what is your experience um, manufacturing devices that allow controlling light for optogenetic experiments? And and ha and the, if the answer is, is no, uh, how complicated or how much of a of a, of a of a burden would be to try to implement something that you haven't done before like that? Mm -hmm. I, this might actually be a better question for Will to answer. I think, sorry, Will, can you jump in on this? Yeah, I mean, this is actually something I do a yeah. lot in my other role at Caltech. Um, I work uh, in a sort of neurobiology uh, insect lab, and we do a lot of optogenetics there. And um, so I would say that, uh, you know, we and we have developed a fair amount of sort of lighting systems, particularly for sort of crimson light stimulus for optogenetics. Um, and uh, there's a few other wavelengths we do. So, I mean, if, these are not products that iRodeo has sold, but they are, I do have a lot of open source. We have some, I have some open source designs on my, my other GitHub page for this, um, if people are interested, um, but they haven't, I haven't mixed the two. I've been trying to keep the iRodeo and the Caltech stuff separate. And so the, the things we, but it, it, this is a very doable thing. Um, and, and there are some open source designs out there. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question because we are often told here that uh, if we don't patent or protect uh, our creations with a, well, a technological patent, then a bigger company can come and, and produce it instead of, uh, of us and that it would kill small companies. Um, and so we have to use this mechanism of intellectual property to, just to allow us and as a, a nicety mechanism for small company to thrive. But in your case, uh, so you're a two people company and you're a successful um, business model. So how do you handle this duality with uh, companies maybe reproducing your work and, and commercializing very similar or um, equipment? So how does it affect your business for instance? And how do you feel about other company producing the same technologies maybe that you are selling? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we, um, you know, obviously our, our whole business philosoph philosophy is that we are going to share everything we do, our designs, and that does leave you to be um, potentially someone could definitely make the things that we make, like the rodeo that they could do that if they wanted to do and sell it. Um, we, um, we do, um, that's one of the reasons why we um, we do think it's really important to build a strong community um, through sub your community support work because other companies aren't going to be able to do that. And also, like because we're because we're a small team, we are pretty flexible and we can pivot and make changes and add features to our products all the time that another company might not necessarily be able to do. And so, yeah, they are always going to have that possibility out there that someone might decide um, to make a rodeo stat or make, you know, one of our other products. We actually haven't seen that happen yet, I don't think. Um, 
so um, hasn't really been an issue yet. Um, what do you think, Will? Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, I, we actively encourage users to build it themselves if they want. I mean, that's something yes. we, that's part of our, um, and like I say, it is a risk that someone could come in and undercut us. I mean, we, we haven't really seen that happen too mm -hmm. much yet. Um, uh, like someone could make a, a, a cheaper rodeo stat and sell it. It's, it's, it's nothing we can do to stop them from doing it. All we can do is offer sort of the best support we can and try to have a good, good community mm -hmm. around it. Um, Thank you. So we have a question and says, uh, Paolo Quintrell, hi, nice presentation. I have a question. Can you use this hardware to measure optical density in microbial cultures? Oh, yeah. I mean, just um, I feel like measuring. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the colorimeter, um, someone has been testing that out and um, we actually do have um, a recent post where we've, we're measuring turbidity with the open colorimeter. And so, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, it's been designed so that you can change the wavelength. So if we're talking about the colorimeter, it's designed so that it can use any wave, you know, um, if you can find the LED, then you can make an LED board and, and use that wavelength. Um, and so we've got our own list of LED wavelengths that the colorimeter uses, but um, often people ask us for a specific um, wavelength and one of the one of the uh, one we have had someone actually ask us about measuring um doing like a growth curve for example of a, a microbial culture so yes definitely you can do that thank you luto you have a new, new question no sorry i, I forgot to lower that Nate. yeah I, I do have another i could bother you guys all day um <laughs> so i wonder i wonder what kind of appetite there is for larger format open source tools. And I'm talking like, I'm thinking from, I come from plants. So like you think about uh, growth chambers or sequencers, stuff like that, that I think there's a lot of proprietary technology and that maybe there's a way to make it open source to make, you know, we've got powerful systems on a chip now. It seems like a lot of that stuff can be knocked off by somebody with some time and you know, wisdom on these topics. So I wonder if that's, if that's uh, maybe it's not something you guys are doing, but maybe somebody in the community. I mean, absolutely. I should, one of the things I, I, I should have added to the talk actually, but um, one of the questions that we had in our survey was, um, what instruments would you like to see open, you know, what open source hardware do you need for your work? And, and it was like a long list. Um, it was a lot of general lab equipment as well. Everybody is experiencing like, the extremely expensive um, lab equipment, right? And it's just extremely costly. And then you can't customize it or modify it on your, um, you know, we want, we, um, we love to hear about how people are customizing um, open hardware. And so there's, like you said, it's, it's really a matter of like finding the people who want, who want to do that. And um, because we, you know, we're at this, we already have our plate full for sure with just two people, um, but like, we really hope to see more um, people doing that kind of work, yeah. Um, and we were happy to give tips um, about manufacturing. And I think the Open Science Shop might be a good place for that as well. Like it really is for people who want to manufacture uh, open hardware science instruments. Um, and then we can, you know, it's a shared co-op as well. So we can share some of the costs of marketing and, and, and help boost each other's work. Because I think the more of us that are doing it, you know, the more accessible, this work will uh, open hardware will become but yeah for sure there's a lot of need out there awesome thank you thank you so much any other question max says is the survey data published online yeah, actually, um, so I did a we did a um, we did a newsletter post and it's on our blog.aorodeo.com. There's a um, there's a post there about the which sort of is a summary of the survey because um, we closed the survey in January. Um, so you can see the results there. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. So do we have any other question, comment? Thank you very much. Your talk was really nice. So thank you also for the organizers. And Seth. 
Yeah, just before closing, I wanted to, um, to say that uh, with Fernand and Paula here, uh, we are working with Joe and we're also purchasing, thanks to the GOSH support, the GOSH community support, uh, several equipments and kits from IU Rodeo. Um, it's in particular, transilluminator and the open colorimeter. So soon we will be organizing a workshop to build this instrument here. Uh, we have a couple of copies then uh, that we want uh, to distribute. Um, so just stay tuned because uh, we will soon announce the dates of the workshop. Uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. So thank you everyone for being here and. Till the next time. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.